Okay. Okay, so we are both in the Zoom room, live on YouTube, and live in the, in the conference room of the Collegio Ghislieri. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for being here uh, in all possible forms. <laughs> and uh, above all, thank you to Professor Brett Caraway for joining our series of seminars. I will briefly introduce him and then let him the, the floor. Professor Caraway is Associate Professor um, at the Institute of Communication, Culture and Information Technology and the, at the Faculty of Information in the University of Toronto. He holds a PhD from the Department of Radio, Television, Film at the University of Texas at Austin. And uh, he, his research focuses on the intersections between low economics and technological development. And for this, he received several prestigious funds. He has three books under revision or forthcoming, among which I just want to cite Economics of Media, Culture and Information with uh, SAG Publishing. And there's many articles published or forthcomings on the themes of uh, technological development, media uh, and uh, populism. He was granted with several awards and honors during his career, among which the Professor of the Year Award for both the academic year 2017-2018 and 2018-2019, uh, voted by the Council and the Body of Students of the ICCIT. He is an affiliated to the International Environmental Communication Association, the International Communication Association, and the Union for Democratic Communications. And he attended during his whole career different kinds of events, academic talks, as both lecturer and keynote speakers, more didact uh, most didactic, uh, more didactic conferences, media interviews and appearances, as well as public talks. So as you can certainly see, is a very requested and busy, and therefore we would like to thank Prof. Caraway once more for, dedica for dedicating us his precious time. And I hope that everything was correct and the, I, the floor is yours. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. I really appreciate the invitation. Um, I don't feel as accomplished as that long list of um, accolades, but it's nice to hear someone read that list. I, I forget sometimes uh, some of those things that are listed in there. The talk that I'm giving today is um, sort of a overview of that book that was mentioned on media, media economics. Um, I'll just go ahead and share screen if that's okay with everybody and then give a little bit of a background into uh, what this particular talk is, where it comes from. So can everybody see my screen? Yes, right. we can. Great. So I am a professor um, of kind of one part communications, one part economics. Um, my background was actually in production originally. I was a musician and enrolled in a department of radio, television, film, because I was hoping to uh, sort of build my, uh, what at the time was called multimedia skill set. Um, I did 3D animation, audio, video, post-production. And I was uh, learning about media right at the time that Napster and BitTorrent and file sharing communities were creating havoc uh, for the recording industry. So as a musician, that was really interested. Uh, that was really interesting to me. I needed to learn a little something about economics, though, in order to make sense of what was happening. So uh, I enrolled in an economics course, having no background in economics whatsoever. As a master's student, uh, I unknowingly enrolled in an economics course taught by a, a very well-known Marxist economist by the name of 
Harry Cleaver, who hails from the Italian Marxist tradition of autonomous Marxism. Uh, so I, I do now have some training in economics, but my training in economics um, is definitely as an outsider to the profession. Um, so I'm interested in media, uh, mainly because media serve a separate set of imperatives than other industries. Things in media don't work the same way as the production of sort of typical goods and services. And so I'm obviously kind of referring to the, the digital world, the networked world, and how different that is from something like manufacturing cars or agricultural commodities. My interest in right-wing populism uh, comes partly out of uh, just my study of communications, but also because I was born and raised and um, went to school in Texas uh, before coming to Canada and the University of Toronto. And I, I actually am coming to you right now from, from Texas uh, because we're doing remote instruction. I'm visiting family back in Texas. And the political landscape here in Texas um, is independent, they like to say, but also there's a lot of right-wing populism um, prevalent in Texas politics. So I've always kind of been interested in tracking um, right-wing and conservative um, political movements, especially how they're reacting online. The idea of right-wing populism used to be a fringe political movement. It used to operate at the margins. But I think as we are all well aware at this point, um, right-wing populism is becoming a dominant political force across the globe. It's no longer just a fringe political element. And in fact, uh, right-wing populist movements are oftentimes part of mainstream political coalitions at this point. I'm interested in right-wing populism. I'm not necessarily critical of it to the exclusion of critiquing left-wing populist movements. I, today, I'm just happen to be talking about right-wing political movements, um, but I, I do have a whole host of similar criticisms uh, to level at the, at the left. So my, my talk today isn't necessarily ideologically motivated, although I don't uh, feel that I have much in common with right-wing political movements, but I'm more interested in it as a, as a social phenomenon rather than engaging in an ideological critique. But we're seeing it everywhere. Uh, France, Sweden, Austria, Italy, of course, Venezuela, India, and definitely um, in my home country of the United States. But even in Canada, too. Uh, everybody thinks Canada is home to uh, sort of political moderation, but there are fringe political movements going on in Canada as well. In the United States, this has become a major concern um, after the January 6th insurrection against the U.S. Capitol um, that House Select Committee that is currently investigating the insurrection is taking a close look at the role of online social media platforms. Uh, they're both interested in how social media platforms were used to organize the insurrection, um, but they're also interested in how members of Congress supported the insurrection um, through social media platforms. They've sequestered um, people from the social media companies, they have requested that information be handed over. So there's an acknowledgement in that investigation that somehow social media plays an important role in the propagation of right-wing political movements. Uh, of course, there's an ongoing struggle right now to sort of cast elections and democratic practice um, into doubt in the United States. And Facebook and Twitter um, are at the center of that firestorm. There was also the whistleblower, uh, I believe her name was Frances, Frances Hagen maybe, came forward and made us all aware of internal research that was being conducted by Facebook. So we now know that the, the platform itself is aware that it is having an impact on political discourse and political and social behavior um, beyond just the virtual world. So 
that's that's where my interests lie. I'm not here to lay all of the blame at the feet of social media. Um, I I think that the history of right wing political movements and popul populism all have much longer histories that goes back further than social networking sites. So I don't think that social networking sites or the internet are the cause of the ascendancy of right-wing authoritarian movements, but they definitely add fuel to the fire, meaning they are catalysts, they cultivate. I have a tendency to look at things in long historical periods, and I think about things in terms of historical transformations. Um, I do tend to look at things through an economic lens, but for me, I'm talking about economics as a history of economic thought, the way in which economic relationships cultivate and make possible and make impossible certain social relationships um, writ large. I, I'm not engaging in economic determinism in this talk. I'm talking about one set of dynamics that have potentially put us in the position that we are currently in. I'm not saying that this is the sole um, explanatory variable, but it is a significant one. So in this talk, I'll be looking at both sort of business models and technological innovation uh, and the role in which it has played in the ascendancy of right-wing authoritarian movements online uh, more recently. Uh, I talk about a, a number of different transformations. I have merchant capitalism as the first um, bullet point up there, and that's a horrible term. Uh, merchant capitalism is sometimes sort of the, the idea of a pre-capitalist period of time. I don't even have dates there because I wouldn't even know how to define that. Uh, mercantilism is another thing that people talk about, and mercantilism was never really a coherent ideology. There wasn't like a school of mercantilist thinkers at the time. Retroactively, we can go backwards and identify important mercantilist thinkers, but uh, it wasn't a coherent school of thought at the time. I just throw that up there so that I can basically have something to juxtapose the industrial revolution uh, against. So by merchant capitalism, I'm really talking about an economic system where we had a lot of producers of, of goods and the, the economic model, the business model, was basically trying to get your goods, either purchase them at a low price or produce them at a low price and then move them somewhere where you could sell them at a higher price. There was a lot of competition at this point. Um, there was no such thing as an industrial sector. There were no trade organizations. There was no finance capitalism um, financing the outlay of significant amounts of capital. Everything was very small. It tended to be artisanal um, handicraft production, meaning goods and goods were made by hand using simple tools. Somewhere in the late 1700s uh, and extending into the early 19th century, things changed. I'm sure you all are familiar with the Industrial Revolution, uh, which played out primarily in Europe and in the United States to some degree. Um, most of the time we define this, we think about it as a, as a sort of technological something. We um, moved from handicraft production to mechanized production. We often talk, to, talk about textile production, uh, where we move from hand-woven, hand-spun um, fabrics made in homes to automated textile machines like the spinning jenny, uh, what else, the spinning mule, uh, automated textile production primarily in uh, England. Um, sometimes we talk about the transformation of fuel. So we moved from wood burning fuel to coal, which was used in iron smeltering, which gave us access to what was called pig iron which was a, a major factor of production for construction. And then of course, there's the, the steam engine, which had a number of uses, but one of the important ones was that it helped to build out a logistical infrastructure, like a transportation structure. So we started seeing uh, a move from horse, horses and draft animals to something like rail. And we were not only moving goods um, across large regional areas, but also across national boundaries. So the industrial revolution, yes, it was technological, but it also 
had some major implications for us on a, on a social level. It gave rise to a nation state. That's why Adam Smith called his book, you know, the, the wealth of nations, trying to figure out where the source of wealth was uh, derived, given the technological changes that were going on. On a social level, uh, we had people coming off of the land and into high density urban populations for the first time. So this is the accumulation of, of a factory proletariat. Oftentimes uh, when people are talking about accumulation in a Marxist sense, they tend to think of it in terms of accumulating profit or, or wealth. When people talk about accumulation, for me, I'm thinking about accumulating the proletariat, accumulating people who are dispossessed from the means of production, accumulating a mass worker. So that's what the division of labor signifies to me. Um, these operations had high fixed costs, meaning these were large scale factories. Um, it required financing. So you see the rise of a finance sector. Um, and then there was something along the lines of increasing marginal cost and decreasing returns to scale. I'm sorry for throwing economic terms out at you. They're awful. It is the dismal science, um, but it's an important part of the story, actually. Back at this time in the 1800s, when you scaled up production of whatever it was that you were producing, textiles, furniture, whatever, you would have decreasing marginal cost for a while. Marginal costs just refer to the cost of producing one more of something. And as you scaled up your operation, it would get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper for a while to produce more and more and more stuff. And the reason that things, the per unit cost of each good would become lower is because you were distributing that huge outlay of capital investment across a greater and greater number of goods. So you were paying, you were embedding the cost of your factory in a greater and greater number of goods. So you were dividing that fixed cost by a higher and higher number which means that the cost of producing goods goes down for a while. But in this period of time, there's a, a point where things go poorly and your marginal costs start to go back up, meaning you can overdo it. I describe this phenomenon as too many cooks in the kitchen. If we are a bakery and we're producing cookies and we're trying to keep up with demand, we might wanna hire more workers for a while to keep up with rising demand. But at some point, given our workspace, our factory, you can actually hire too many people and we might be stumbling over each other. So at, you also might be using up all of the flour, all of the sugar, all of the eggs that are available on the market. So the factors of production themselves start to become scarce and their price goes up. So all of this is to say that at some point it becomes counterproductive to keep producing a greater and greater quantity. It's very abstract and it's very old. Why is he talking about this? What does this have to do with right-wing populism? It, it is important because information economics operates on a different set of tendencies or imperatives. So there was an industrial model of information production as well. So um, this happens in, you know, starting in the late, 1700s, really increasing in the 1800s and uh, into the 20th century, both in Europe and in the United States and Canada, you had uh, industrial sectors of information production crop up, first of which was newspapers. And newspapers, very much like Facebook, were interested in drawing readers in, um, both for subscription business models, they were charging people for access to news, but also because they started implanting advertisements in the printed page. So they wanted to accumulate greater and greater audiences. So they started producing scandalous material to keep people interested. That was the first time that we started seeing that phenomenon. And of course, that's what Twitter and Facebook and a lot of the social media sites do today. Starting in the late 19th century, uh, we saw the first major industrial unions, uh, I'm sorry, not industrial unions, industrial monopolies. Uh, come onto the scene. So this was the, tele the age of the telegraph, um, which was followed up by the telephone. So in North America, the, the great monopolies here were Western Union, followed by the Bell system or AT&T. In motion pictures, 
um, which had its early history in places like France and Italy, actually. Um, once it came to the United States, it was initially centered under Edison in New York City, but eventually moved out to California and became Hollywood. And there were large motion picture studios like RKO, um, MGM, 20th Century Fox, United Artists, et cetera. Um, and the studio system, those were also highly concentrated. Radio, which eventually set the standard for broadcast communications in general, um, and definitely set the template for the later development of television, that was dominated by another massive monopoly uh, in North America, um, which was known as um, RCA, the Radio Corporation of America. In Europe, you had the Marconi system, um, Guglielmo Marconi um, took moved from Italy to markets in um, the United Kingdom and then also in Canada and the United States. And then television was uh, dominated by RCA as well. The, the model here was one of highly concentrated industry, meaning there were very few players in these markets and they preferred stability, meaning they preferred stability in terms of market share and profitability. So there, this was the period of what some of you may know as monopoly capitalism, large scale enterprises. And the communications infrastructure here was really important because it gave rise to a marketplace that was dominated by large scale enterprises. Uh, market coordination of that merchant capitalist period was replaced by managerial coordination. And in fact, the ownership of firms and the management of firms became split at this point and management became really, really key to all of this. In terms of politics and in uh, terms of political character of the communications, what was paramount, very important to these companies was having a brand safe environment. You needed a lot of people watching. And so you could guarantee that by keeping the markets highly concentrated and exercising tight control over the content, um, but also staying stable in terms of the type of news that you were, were reporting. So you have the birth of national identity um, around the period of World War II. You have the use of um, highly concentrated media systems for propaganda, et cetera. A lot of the communication technologies required high investments in capital. So there was a lot of finance involved. I put the electromagnetic spectrum up there as the last bullet point, because when you go back and read around the advent of radio communication, it looks a lot like the internet, or at least the internet as we saw it in the 1990s. There was a lot of talk about how radio would be used for the everyday person to communicate. We would communicate across international boundaries and we would have a greater um, understanding of each other. We would enter into a prolonged period of global peace. This is what the, the popular journalism was saying about radio. And the idea for that came because they thought you couldn't regulate the electromagnetic spectrum. This was, uh, uh, you know, the, the so-called ether in the air was a, a publicly held good. There's no way to put a fence around the electromagnetic spectrum. You can't regulate it. It's inherently democratic. We moved from the 1920s into the 1930s and we saw the rise of fascism across the globe. So the hopes of uh, these early radio enthusiasts were dashed. But even when fascism wasn't rearing its ugly head in places uh, like Canada and the United States and other parts of Europe, the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum was becoming centralized, placed under control through government fiat of a handful of large corporations. So there was um, a move towards concentration, both just straight through government fiat, but also through markets. So again, at high fixed costs, you did have decreasing marginal costs though, and increasing returns to scale. The reason I'm pointing to that in terms of communications is because once you had um, the radio broadcasting operations in place, the transmission tower, the studios to make motion pictures, um, once you had the, the printing presses up and running, you could print a lot of material and not face escalating costs. So there was 
uh, a tendency for the marginal costs not to start to go up after a time, but to continue a downward trajectory. So there was an incentive to produce a lot of material. Um, but you still had high levels of ownership concentration. And these companies oftentimes exercised what was known as gatekeeping control, meaning they were the ones that determined what the nation would be talking about. They might not necessarily exercise um, mind control and tell you how you're supposed to think about something, but they would at least set the agenda about what was important, what was considered important, what the news of the day was. So there's gatekeeping and agenda setting going on at this time. And then I have this notion of national markets um, sort of being tied to the development of broadcast communications infrastructure. And we had something referred to by Benedict Anderson as imagined communities, which is to say that we were imagining we were socially constructing a national identity about what it meant to be Italian or German or Japanese or Canadian or British or something like that. Uh, and the broadcast communications model was really important for that. Somewhere starting in the 1960s, actually in the post-World War II period, all of this got turned on its head. Computing was a byproduct of World War II um, in the context of uh, Europe during World War II, the British were very keen on cryptographic um, or cryptography to break the German U-boat codes. So the Germans had their Enigma um, crypto cryptographic system and the British needed to know what the communications were um, among the, the German military. So they came up with a computer known as the Colossus um, it's a very storied history, the development of that. In the United States, it was the ENIAC, um, which was more about a firing table crisis, studying ballistics, essentially, um, throwing stuff at each other to kill large numbers of people. Um, shortly after World War II, it became about having the computational power um, to support thermonuclear ignition, thermonuclear research. The ENIAC quickly became what was known as the UNIVAC, which was a commercial um, mainframe computer, which was uh, used for all that managerial coordination that I was talking about. Somewhere in, starting around 1976, Apple Computer shows up um, offering the, you know, the Apple One computer, which was the first computer um, to really go into the home. Before that, there were some other computers that were somewhat obscure, like the Altair 8800, which was mainly a computer uh, targeting in hobbyists or computing enthusiasts. But you had to have a high degree of technological proficiency and understanding to use those initial models. But when Apple showed up with their version, um, it opened up markets to people um, with low levels of technological proficiency. Um, the partnership between Windows, IBM, uh, the partnership actually between Microsoft, IBM, and Intel happens in the early 1980s, I think around 1981, 83. That gives rise to the PC. So by the mid-1980s, you have a, a fairly strong home computer, personal computer market developing uh, across the world. There were other major players in Europe, uh, but it spread pretty quickly across the world. The internet itself... Um, is a byproduct of the Department of Defense in the United States. They were concerned with making what was known as a packet switched network. They wanted a network that would be capable of surviving um, thermonuclear detonation. If uh, the old circuit switch telephone networks, um, because they were centrally managed in a switching facility with operators literally like connecting your calls, um, if you were to destroy one of those centralized nodes, you could essentially disable large chunks of the communications infrastructure in the United States and North America. So packet switching was developed as a way to decentralize the nodes um, and distribute the intelligence across the network. That's what the early ARPANET was. That was uh, a, um, a project from a subsidiary of the Department of Defense known as the Advanced Research Projects Agency, which was a crazy organization that was concerned with all kinds of things, mainly figuring out 
you know, really efficient ways of killing large numbers of people, disrupting <laughs> communication systems of adversaries, et cetera. Uh, but the first internet connections, which happened among as little as I think four nodes at major universities in the United States was actually in 1969. So it was a long time ago. Email was in the 1970s. So this has a very long history. What we all recognize as the internet really is probably the World Wide Web, which is the marriage between browsers and HTML, hypertext markup language. And that happens in the mid 1990s. And uh, we see things like the domain name system, which is, uh, you know, instead of having to remember a long binary, not binary, but alpha, uh, it's not even alphanumeric, just a numeric string of, a string of numbers essentially uh, broken up by four periods, you could actually just type in www.amazon.com, something like that. The domain name system made it possible for us to easily search and find things that were connected to the network. Again, lowering the level of technological proficiency. It's the same thing that HTML, HTML basically sets the criteria for how information is um, displayed um, and, and uh, does it in sort of a standardized way across devices. And of course, browsers lower the level of technological proficiency by incorporating things like images and video alongside text. So all of these technological advances kept lowering the level of technological proficiency that was required to participate in virtual communities. So like I said, this history goes way back and it is born out of the military, but it's also born out of a notion of sort of cyber libertarian, which is a byproduct of a specific culture in Silicon Valley in the Bay Area of San Francisco in California. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as the Californian ideology, the idea that we're going to create a connected system of virtual communities that is unregulatable. You can't control it. It can't fall under centralized control. Um, and it has a, a jurisdiction that is global. The idea here that I'm trying to get across is that there was an ideology behind the internet and the way it was presented to the public. And we have fallen far short of, of that ideology of a cyber libertarian utopia. Uh, but nevertheless, again, we had high fixed cost. We had decreasing marginal cost. This is because digital goods are in essence uh, subject to zero marginal costs. Meaning if I have a the analogy that I use with my students is if I came to your house and stole all of the food out of your refrigerator, out of your kitchen, when you woke up in the morning, you would realize that I had stolen all of your food because it's scarce. It would be gone. My use of your food precludes your ability to also use that food. But on the other hand, if I broke into your computer over a network and copied all of the music and all of your, uh, you know, pirated uh, motion pictures off of your computer, you might be none the wiser. I could copy all of that stuff in essence, steal it from you, but that doesn't mean there's one less motion picture or one less song for you to consume. It's not scarce in this sense. My consumption of it doesn't preclude your ability to consume the same good. Um, so in, in a sense, property law, the law that manages physical goods is about the management of scarcity, but intellectual property law is about producing scarcity where there is no inherent scarcity. That's why copyright and trademark and patent tensions run so high in the networked economy. Everything that I'm just saying is actually bullshit. There is scarcity behind even sharing digital goods. I'm, I'm not getting into it, but I also teach ecological economics. And the sharing of all of this material on Facebook definitely burns scarce resources. All of the server farms um, that run everything that we do, including what we're doing right now, in turn uh, necessitates burning fuel somewhere. So although the internet economy appears like it's not scarce, it actually is subject to the use of finite resources still. But that's beyond the scope of the discussion here. Another important thing that's happening is the birth of what's known as platform economics. Facebook, 
uh, in many respects operates what's known as a multi-sided market or a two-sided market. But that's old too. Newspapers used to do that. Newspapers are in the business, even back in the 1800s, of connecting different groups of people that wouldn't be able to find each other otherwise. Like a popular platform might be a ride-sharing um, platform like Uber or Lyft or something like that, that connects people who have cars with people who want rides. So you use the platform and the platform connects the two sides of this market together. And uh, people think that this is some brand new phenomenon and are swooning over the new platform economics. In fact, it's, it's an old system. Newspapers connected readers, potential consumers with advertisers. So that too is an old economic model. But having said that, it is becoming more and more prevalent. And oftentimes these markets are not just two-sided, they're multi-sided. So Facebook does a lot of different things. It connects the Facebook user with advertisers, like what used to happen, um, but it also connects them with uh, news makers, like uh, broadcast journalistic firms. It also connects users with app developers. Like there's more and more market actors that are connecting to each other over these platforms. And that's a good position to be in if you can run that platform, but it also means that those businesses have more vulnerabilities because they have to manage all of those relationships. Another important part, perhaps the most important part of the economic transformation going on with the internet is the notion of participatory culture. And here's where we get to right-wing populism. Participatory culture means that these firms are making use of UGC, which I have abbreviated there, which just stands for user generated content. So whereas a newspaper or a, a conventional broadcaster employed journalists or motion picture stars or television actors and actresses to create material under a, a set of norms that were professionalized, social media companies use user generated content, amateur content not just amateur content, they still use professional content as well, but they are rather agnostic when it comes to the content. They don't care necessarily where the content comes from. They're quite happy to use um, amateur content because they don't have to pay, pay for it, for its generation. Um, and then of course, another important thing here is that these um, platforms, so platforms that do user-generated content primarily are like I would say YouTube or Vimeo, something like that. But there's another group of uh, websites, which are platforms, but their emphasis is on social networking. So this is where you can create a network of friends, you can share content, you can instant message people, et cetera. That would be like Facebook, uh, Friendster, MySpace, those sorts of websites. The user-generated content sites and the social networking sites have overlap trying to draw a distinction between them is impossible in practical terms. I'm only doing it analytically here. YouTube has aspects of social networking. Facebook has notions or aspects of user-generated content. Uh, analytically speaking, you might make an argument for which one emphasizes what, but there's not a hard line distinction between these categories. All of these are giving rise to what some people have referred to as an inscription economy, meaning what they are attempting to do is reduce every possible moment of human interaction to a moment of economic exchange. I'll say that again. These sites have a business model that compels them to reduce every single moment of human interaction to a moment of economic exchange. The things that you and I would say to each other casually, if we were just hanging out at a bar, um, having drinks or at a restaurant or spending time sitting on a couch watching television. Every one of those communications used to be ephemeral. They were here and then they were gone. No longer. Now we communicate over these platforms and those little communications end up as part of a larger repository and they are commodified. They are sold to marketing aggregators. They are used to develop a profile for you. Um, you are sold to your profile is sold to advertisers, et cetera. That's the business model for us personally. 
it means that we can be held accountable for every flippant remark that we've ever made um, on a social media platform. So that's the notion of lateral surveillance, where we're all essentially policing each other's behavior. It's like Foucault's panopticon gone wild. There's a lot of people who are very optimistic about this networked information economy. Uh, this is like Yohai Binkler, who wrote a, a book about 15, 10, 15 years ago, known as The Wealth of Networks. Uh, it's available online in PDF form for free. But his argument was essentially that personal computers and the internet have essentially distributed the means of production uh, throughout society. Now, you know, thinking about what you can do with something like the Adobe Creative Suite with Premiere, um, Audition, um, After Effects, Maya, all of these different pieces of software, you can make in your home what it used to take hundreds, if not thousands of people working collectively under professional relationships. Just even 30 years ago, you essentially in your computer have a motion picture studio apparatus. And that's pretty phenomenal. Um, and that's given rise to both uh, non-market and non-proprietary production, meaning not everything is subject to intellectual property or is um, created out of a motivation to profit from it. Some of this is just fulfilling our own creative aspirations just because, art for art's sake, to use a cliche. Um, that's created a lot of tensions over intellectual property. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, copyright um, litigation that has been launched against sites like YouTube in particular. And there were all of these benefits that were supposed to come from this. Um, more people would get to participate in the public sphere and political discourse. We would be able to be more autonomous, meaning we could do more by and for ourselves. If I have a, a headache, maybe I get on the internet and try and diagnose myself. I don't have to go see a doctor or a nurse. We would have a robust public sphere with a whole bunch of different perspectives, and we would become more self-reflective and world peace. I don't know. It sounded to me, the 1990s sounded very much to me like the 1920s discourse around radio. Where are we now? We are in a hellish dystopia of uh, political polarization and extremist radicalized politics. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm being... I'm exaggerating for effect, but uh, I don't think we have reached the cyber libertarian utopia um, that we were promised. We have a signal to noise ratio problem. It's hard to, for a lot of people still to find good information, to filter out bad information. We still have a marketplace that is dominated um, it's no by a few firms. It's no longer RCA and Bell Telephone. Now it's Alphabet, the owners of Google. It's obviously Facebook. Um, it's Alibaba. It's it's a lot of major players across the world. Um, we have journalism, a journalism sector which has just been gutted, absolutely devastated. And so we're having a crisis and trying to um, keep up journalistic activity because the the floor has really been pulled out from underneath the journalism um, industry. And then we have political polarization. That's what I mean by social atomization. It means that we are sort of self-selecting into narrow, 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 narrow communities, virtual communities. We are uh, trying to avoid cognitive dissonance. It causes us to feel challenged and uncomfortable when we're exposed to other viewpoints. So we tend to select uh, people who have the same perspectives as us. The research um, done by media studies scholars thus far has tended to emphasize left-wing movements. And my own research has actually, uh, my, my empirical research into the use of um, internet technologies and platforms for collective action has been centered on labor movements myself. I've looked at Walmart workers who are trying to organize to improve working conditions and raise wages, which is not exactly a left-wing movement, but it is a labor movement. Um, the, the guy who trained me, Harry Cleaver, um, his an, initial writings were on the Zapatistas and the use of news groups and email lists serves um, to shed light on their struggles um, down in Chiapas back in the 1990s. 
in the late 90s, uh, there was a lot of research done on the internet and the battle in Seattle, the, the WTO protests that happened. Some of you may remember Occupy Wall Street, um, a flash in the pan that happened um, directly after the 2008 financial crisis. Of course, there was the Arab, Arab Spring, uh, Tunisia that spread out across the Arab speaking world. There's obviously some political movements that are associated with the copy left, the pirate um, the pirate party, so to speak. A lot of research has been on these sorts of movements. What has been less um, well studied has been right-wing political movements. And I'm not exactly sure why that is. The, the right-wing populist movements don't go, uh, they don't start with the internet. They don't start in 1969 when those first interface message processors connected those nodes. Of course, it goes way back. Um, in the late 19th century in the United States, you had the so-called People's Party, which was an agrarian movement that was, uh, you know, rising up actually against moneyed interests and eventually was um, sort of amalgamated with the Democratic Party. So that one actually went left. Um, Right-wing populist movements really kind of start up in the post-World War I period. Um, obviously, fascism. Uh, fascist movements um, were, uh, you know, their wellspring was places like Italy and Germany, and then they spread out across the globe. Um, in the post-World War II period, the sort of neo-fascist or post-fascist post um, organizations started up, but there were also populist movements too. So one of the things that I think is really important is making sure we know the difference between all of these different terms, populism and fascism, et cetera. But just to go over a laundry list of all the different movements that I can think of, you've got the French National Front, you've got the Alternative for Germany, you've got Gold, Golden Dawn in Greece, um, you've got the Sweden Democrats. Um, in Italy, what? It's the League and then the, bro the Brothers of Italy, I think, are the kind of two two main mainstream the right-wing populist parties, both of which those two parties have, for the record, disavowed fascism. Like they, they have tried to soften um, what they're doing, but those, those parties strike me as a reaction to austerity uh, and the waves of immigration that are sweeping out across the, the EU right now. Um, and then in Canada, it's the People's Party of Canada which is uh, started in 2018. And that's like a federal, like a federal um, sort of right-wing libertarian party. And then in the United States, um, right-wing populists have kind of taken over the Republican party. Um, so with Trump, you've seen an alignment with um, former conservatives and right-wing populism and authoritarianism. But the idea of fascism and populism are, are different um, to some degree. Fascism, I usually associate it, I'm gonna give you a horrible um, definition as I try and do this on the fly, but I, when I think of fascism, I usually think of nationalism. I usually think of uh, sometimes violent suppression of all political opposition. I think of um, state-run enterprises sort of the subjugation of individual interests to the interests of the state. Um, I usually think of sort of narratives around national rebirth and strong leaders. Authoritarianism is kind of a, a cultural value that emphasizes sort of conformity and collective notions of security and loyalty to whatever the one true ideology or identity is. Uh, authoritarian populism is kind of a, a use of a leader who comes forward to defend the one true people. So in populism, whether it's right wing or left wing, there's this notion of the authentic people of the country, however they want to define that, usually along ethno-nationalist or religious lines but the, the true people are somehow being screwed over by a government that has been taken over by well-financed special interests that are not responsive to the needs of the true people. So it's a narrative of the people versus the elite. There's usually also this notion of methodological individualism, which is a very academic-y term. 
that's not part of popular discourse, but it simply means that if you want to describe social phenomenon, you fall back to individual subjectivity. It's the individual subjective motivation of us as individuals that you just add together, which gives rise to society. So if you're trying to understand social phenomenon, you basically ask character, character questions about individuals. It's not like a notion of class or yeah, class, essentially, which is the realm of political economy. Um, all of this is, can be perceived as a reaction to demographic and social changes that are going on in society. Uh, there's something called backlash theory, actually, which is that um, disenfranchised populations are reacting to demographics changes. Oftentimes, there's an uh, assumption that right-wing populism um, emerges when there's economic hardship, and then when there is economic good times or economic growth, that that in turn um, fuels liberalization of, of political discourse, more progressive politics. So uh, oftentimes scholars point to austerity, increases in immigration, um, and the sort of living standards uh, to, as a root cause of the rise in populism. And certainly real wages have been stagnating for most of North America and Europe since the 1970s, real wages being wages adjusted for inflation. Uh, there, I'm using the term economic uncertainty here though, instead of economic stagnation, because I'm pointing to the fact that our economies have not stagnated. This is not the Great Depression. We've had moments of economic downturn, but overall the pattern has been growth. So I use the term economic uncertainty to point to the fact that just because um, certain segments of the economy are doing well overall, there are other pockets of the population that are subject to greater and greater degrees of uncertainty, meaning they don't have lifetime stable employment. We're not um, working for one company for our entire lives, paying into a pension. Now it's a gig economy and we might be automated out of our jobs. And interestingly enough, that sort of pressure, that uncertainty falls primarily on the lower end of the middle class. So the, in the 2016 election, the, the lowest of the low on the socioeconomic uh, spectrum in the United States actually voted for Hillary Clinton in greater numbers. It was the middle class, the lower part of the middle class that voted for Trump. And the reason that they did that is because they, they were in a section of skill hierarchy and uh, industrial sectors that were in danger. So there is some truth to this, I think. But one thing that's important here is it's not about absolute de deprivation. It doesn't mean that you are watching your wages go down. Your wages may be going up, but if your wages and your social status are not going up relative to other groups, that's relative deprivation, meaning you have this sort of idea that your group, whatever it is, as you define it, isn't doing as well as some other groups. I think another important thing here is spatial segregation, which is the fact that people are tending to be concentrated in cities. So in the United States, we have a, a phenomenon that's called the density divide, which means that people who are um, higher educated, more um, diverse tend to self-select into our major cities, giving rise to so-called mega cities. So all of the economic dynamism in the United States tends to be out on the West Coast or the East Coast in places like New York City and San Francisco. That leaves this, what we sometimes refer to as flyover country in the United States, um, more homogenous. It tends to be more religiously conservative politically conservative, it tends to be more white in terms of demographic makeup. Um, and that's creating a polarization between uh, urban and rural populations. There's also been a decline in institutional trust. Of course, there's always been distrust in government, in news media. You see um, populists uh, stoking the fans of, of doubt against those sorts of institutions, but it's also targeting corporations and universities, uh, scientists, particularly when we were talking about climate change. With respect to the COVID-19 pandemic, public health authorities have been um, the target of conspiracy theories. 
the church is a reoccurring target of uh, criticism. And I'm not suggesting that this is bad writ large. Uh, this is one of the ways through which we, we hold our leaders accountable. So being skeptical isn't necessarily a bad thing, but this is turning into something called effective polarization. So I have political adversaries as a final bullet point up there, second to the last bullet point. There's political polarization, which means that uh, you know, left-wing people tend to talk trash about right-wing people, right-wing people talk trash about left-wing people, and they disagree sometimes ferociously. And that's polarization. That's not necessarily a bad thing up to a certain point, but it can bleed into what's known as affective polarization, which is more emotional affect. And in that scenario, you view your opposition as unredeemable. You can't even talk to them because if they are put in power, they will destroy your country. They will destroy your identity, et cetera. So you get into an ungovernable situation. And then, of course, one of the big problems in the United States right now and in other places, but there's a discourse that's targeting elections right now, calling into question the actual practice of democratic governance. So where does online social media fall into all of this? Of course, we have a signal to noise ratio problem. It's hard to find authoritative, trustworthy information. There's fake news and misinformation. Fake news is deliberately uh, misleading, usually involving some kind of character assassination. Uh, misinformation might be misleading on purpose, but it might just be poor information. We also have search and discovery algorithms that are based on what's known as a popularity principle. So Google, for example, in their page rank algorithms points to essentially the most popular material on the internet, not necessarily the most trustworthy or authoritative. We've had a collapse of the editorial function because of the explosion in media outlets. There's not one newspaper or a handful of newspapers to hold accountable. Now there's a ton of information sources and it's very difficult to engage in an editorial function. And in fact, in the United States, Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, they don't want to engage in editorial functions because if they do start to become editors, meaning they start policing the content on their websites, then the regulators will treat them differently. They will lose what's known as their safe harbor provision. Right now, they are just an information service. If they start to act like an editor, then they will be treated as a news company. And if they're treated as a news company, then they have a whole lot of extra obligations and hoops that they have to jump through. So they want to not engage in editorial functions to the extent they can avoid it. And then populists use social media to bypass traditional news media to some extent. Donald Trump was great at this. Um, he would tweet out stuff constantly. Modi in India does the exact same thing. Um, it's not so much that they are doing a complete in run around broadcasters, but they can get their message out without having to go through a journalist. And then the media dutifully provides coverage to whatever the tweets are. So they're really driving the agenda. And it also gives them a means of avoiding um, the, the political apparatus of their particular party. Social media sites are also segregating us though, not just spatially, but virtually, meaning we are self-selecting into particular virtual communities. We self-select into Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, whatever it is. Um, but we even do more than that. We self-select into particular social networks, friend networks. We join particular groups. We follow particular influencers. So we're self-selecting into these groups, which um, gives rise to something known as a filter bubble, which I think I cover at some point in here. No, I don't really do it, so I'll do it here. Um, a filter bubble basically means that you are trying to avoid cognitive dissonance, so you find like-minded people, and that creates an echo chamber or an information cocoon, and you're not being exposed to other political viewpoints. And so that's supposed to lead to political polarization. The research on this is actually mixed. I'm not I don't buy into it so much. Uh, I just got done reading one study where they took liberal people and made them follow conservative people. And then they took conservative people and made them follow liberal people because they thought if you were exposed to different uh, political perspectives, it would sort of mitigate your extremist viewpoints. 
that did not happen. In fact, the people either had very little change in their political perspective or they doubled down on their pre-existing position, meaning they entrenched or even went further to the uh, political extremes. So I'm, I'm not sure what the answer is there, but there's a lot of emphasis placed on this notion of a, of a filter bubble. I'm not discounting it totally, um, but I'm skeptical that it's the primary problem, it, but it is a major problem. Um, meaningful communities mean that the algorithms themselves send us into um, particular pockets. So YouTube is known for something as the rabbit hole effect, which they've supposedly addressed. If you look up something like Donald Trump and you just let YouTube keep doing its autoplay function, eventually you will be taken to you know, 9-11 conspiracies that the Twin Towers were not hit by airplanes or that the Sandy Hook shooting, school shooting was staged, false flag events, um, et cetera. Meaning the search and discovery algorithms themselves gravitate to more and more and more extreme um, groups or content. Similarly, social networking sites, their algorithms of suggestions um, tend to gravitate towards more extreme groups, more um, untrustworthy or outlandish uh, news stories. Why are they doing this? Are they just, you know, do they want to see the world burn? I, I don't think it's uh, necessarily that they are just bad actors. I think they are following uh, a business model which emphasizes advertising revenues. And what is all important for advertising revenue is maximizing user engagement. So user engagement with a brand means that you're not just passively watching an ad. That's great. But what they really want you to do is comment on an ad, share the ad, click like on the ad. Those are engagement metrics that the advertising industry is relying on in the context of interactive platforms. So they really want to maximize engagement. The way to maximize engagement is to put forward divisive, extreme, extreme content. That's what keeps people entertained. So I think it's the, the chasing of advertising revenues makes Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok perhaps even, um, gravitates towards this sort of content that is high on entertainment value, but not necessarily civic value. And the net result of that is that it has facilitated division or political polarization um, it increases performativity instead of actual policy analysis. So by performativity, I mean that Instagram beckons you to hold your Facebook, I mean, hold your smartphone and take a picture rather than actually taking in the, the scenery around you, right? But similarly, it asks us, it beckons us to perform a political identity, not understand policy, but actually perform an identity. I identify as a conservative or I identify as a, a liberal or a progressive, or I identify as a Marxist, whatever it is. And it's, it's a performative thing where we are confusing politics with identity. Um, and then as I indicated that these things are basically driving the, the news discourse, um, it's like a new agenda setting function. And oftentimes we are also having Facebook and Twitter amplify in the context of right-wing populism, sort of a alternative um, right-wing media sphere, a media ecology. So this would be like the Breitbart's um, America First. I can't remember all of the different right-wing um, news outlets, which ironically still draw on normal journalistic output from things like the Washington Post and New York Times. They just put in a, a political perspective interpretation on top of that. But because the newspaper industry, the journalism industry is already suffering, they are drawing on an anemic uh, you know, journalism output and then pushing it through a, a political or ideological lens, which makes for a pretty awful um, alternative media landscape. I put brand safety there uh, because I don't want to lead you to the conclusion that they will just keep getting as extreme as possible in pushing this kind of content. They also have to run these multi-sided markets. 
So that means keeping everybody happy. And advertisers don't like extreme content. Advertisers don't want their ad to run next to an ISIS beheading video. That's not good for business. You have trouble selling cars or whatever it is when you juxtapose those sorts of um, messages together. So companies like AT&T, Pepsi, Walmart, Lyft, uh, rentals, uh, car rental um, companies like Enterprise, all of these different companies have at various times pulled their advertising from companies like Google and Facebook because their commercial messages were juxtaposed against extremist political content. So the platforms are responsive to some degree based on, again on the advertising um, and occasionally political pressure like around the um, 2020 election, Facebook backtracked for a little bit, but you know, how there's always going to be this pushing the envelope of how how close they can get to the edge without actually ruining their multi-sided market and seeing advertisers flee so just as a quick conclusion here just a snapshot of what's going on uh, there's a couple of different approaches that the social media sites are taking uh, twitter is engaging in labeling content so uh, misleading information means that um, it's they can draw on some authorities who say that this is factually wrong and they'll slap a label across it. Dispute it means exactly what you would think. It means that there's some disagreement about how true or accurate the information is. Unverified means that this sounds crazy, but we can't find corroborating evidence to back it up or refute it. Google and or YouTube, same company, um, they've actually said they placed thresholds that said you have to have so many followers before you can start earning advertising revenue. Um, so that way they are basically trying to take the profitability away from the more fringe content creators on YouTube. And they've outright prohibited misinformation, um, most, re most recently around COVID-19 and climate change denialism. Uh, Facebook has attempted to ban groups, Instagram too, also the same company that are propagating conspiracy theories. This is definitely targeted at uh, QAnon conspiracy theories, the hardest. QAnon wouldn't even exist today, I'm convinced, if it weren't for algorithms. QAnon is a byproduct It is a, of, of algorithms. It is an algorithmically generated um, social movement, conspiracy theory community. Um, around elections, Twitter and Facebook have made various pledges to police their content. I anticipate that they will do this again in the 2022 midterms in the United States and again in the presidential election in 2024. But again, they tend to only, it's like a special occasion. It's like McDonald's serving up the McRib once a year or whatever, or the uh, pumpkin spice latte coming to Starbucks. It's like a holiday event. They put the restrictions in place for the elections, and then they pull away uh, and go back to business as usual. And then they're, they're kind of torn about what to do with domestic terrorism groups. So they've banned um, militia groups in the United States, but this also plays out on an international level. After the United States withdrew from Afghanistan recently, the Taliban has uh, tried to sort of soften its public image and they immediately went to YouTube and a couple of the other social networking sites to post PR messages and they're trying to um, engage in global discourse as the representatives of Afghanistan. And so this leaves companies like Facebook and YouTube in a, a real conundrum of whether or not to acknowledge them, should they ban them? Um, so this is a thorny problem that I think will continue. In terms of a way forward, like what do you do um, to combat all of these problems? Uh, at various times, I've put forward the notion of media and information literacy um, programs, integrating those into public schools, universities, and colleges. But the idea here is teaching people how to actually execute a search query in a way that brings back useful and authoritative and trustworthy information for them. So I sound like a li if I sound like a librarian when I talk about that, well, that's the function that librarians actually served before the advent of the World Wide Web. Uh, I also think that government regulators should probably um, set up definitions for what actually constitutes harmful content 
on user generated content and social networking sites, and then regulate it, set thresholds for the amount of harmful content that is allowable. And then if those thresholds are surpassed, um, you fine a company. So there's a regulatory approach. And then of course, uh, some people have put forward the notion of nationalizing social media sites and user generated content sites in the same way that some telecommunications infrastructures have been nationalized. And uh, while I entertain those thoughts, uh, I'm unsure how that uh, sort of brings these, these problems um, to an end. I understand that if you were to uh, sort of displace or supplant the advertising model, that perhaps the, the sites could answer to a, a different set of uh, imperatives of, you know, maybe highlighting or bringing to the, the top of your search results content that has civic value rather than entertainment value. But I'm not sure. Those are the different uh, sort of proposals that I've seen floated. I just haven't landed on one yet. I suppose I have to finish this book that I'm writing before I can commit to one. We'll see. Uh, anyway, I'll open it up to uh, comments, questions, discussion. So uh, first of all, again, thank you very much for the interesting, very interesting presentation. Um, I don't know if there are questions here uh, or in the Zoom room. Uh, Okay. Uh, for uh, people in the Zoom room, you have to raise your hand uh, so to uh, make questions. For those that are here uh, in the conference room, you can come here and pose your question to Professor Carway. For the moment, I think no one is uh, in the Zoom room, so if someone Good evening. Um, first of all, me too. I would like to thank you for joining and have this conversation with us. Um, Dan, my question for you is the following. Um, you quickly talk about left-wing parties, or um, better I say, of past left-wing movement. So um, please, I would like to uh, I would like you to give us an example of a present and a winning left-wing authoritarian party, um, if it exists. For example, I, I thought about um, Pedro Castillo in uh, Peru and uh, his, um, his, his party, Peru Libre, but I'm not sure it can be considered as, uh, as a, a left-wing party. And uh, moreover, I was wondering uh, whether the mechanism you, that you explained you explain uh, as applied to right-wing right party uh, can also be a left-wing party. Um, so um, if it is possible to make the same consideration or if there are to make different considerations. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's a really great question. Thank you for that. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the types of parties that come to mind that are uh, actively engaged um, in social networking uh, and user-generated contents. I can think of maybe Podemos, um, um, Syriza, is that how you say it? Syriza is in, in Greece, I believe, uh, which is like a, what, a sort of progressive, an alliance of progressive groups. Uh, in, in Italy, is it, or where is it? Is it maybe in Spain? MS Five. I can't remember what the what the name was. There was a another organization. It was like a political court uh, organization. But if I remember them correctly, they were like uh, hard to define. If that's the organization that I'm thinking of, they had like a, a strong environmental um, platform, but also kind of uh, on certain on certain issues would fall maybe even libertarian. Um, I think that the, for me, the, the organization that I'm most familiar with that has made good use 
of uh, the internet has been the Zapatistas, the Izelin in, in Chiapas. Uh, most recently, um, they were organizing, uh, well, I shouldn't say most recently, the one that I, that I remember uh, was covered in news media maybe five or six years ago um, was a like a, a public protest that they did where I think they maybe walked from Chiapas uh, to the capital in Mexico City protesting uh, drug violence and, and, and drug cartels. Um, so those are the those are the main ones that I can think of. But the, I think that the the dynamic the dynamic between right and left, I'm always very cautious about drawing what is sometimes referred to as the fallacy of equivalence, that whatever you see happening on the right wing has a, a counter or counter tendency that's a, showing up on, on the left. Um, I, I think that there's, there's differences going on, although I think that the left uh, at various times has attempted to make good use of social media sites for collective action. Um, but I'm not sure, I, I know less about sort of established left-wing political parties and how, and how they're organizing. And I'm also a little less knowledgeable around uh, left-wing social, social movements. Uh, in Canada, the idle no more Social movement happened uh, as a result of uh, some of the extractive industries uh, and the pipeline construction um, running across parts of Canada and in the United States. Um, and then certainly wa uh, Occupy Wall Street, broadly speaking, was sort of another left-wing movement um, that had a, a populist element to it. Um, a lot of anger directed at the banks that were bailed out, the sort of two too big to fail, um, whereas the, the people who were actually losing their homes uh, because of uh, defaulting on their mortgages didn't receive any assistance. Um, a lot of the spontaneous uprisings that happened there uh, were, again, facilitated um, by platforms like Twitter uh, and Facebook. I think in Turkey, uh, you've seen some resistance um, to Erdogan and the sort of hard hardline approach. Um, so there are pockets of it here and there. But again, I think that the the dynamics are different across the political pers the political spectrum. And uh, you know, you would have to really go do some empirical work to see how these groups took advantage of the platforms and to what effect, how effectively they were able to achieve whatever their objectives were. So uh, we have a hand raised here in Zoom. Uh, Simone uh, has a question, I think. Yes, that's fine. Uh, my question is quite related to the previous one. And uh, um, it's like uh, I'm not I'm not really uh, sure, but it's uh, it's my uh, one of my doubts about uh, the using of these uh, of this category political category of uh, populism. Mm -hmm. um, don't you think that uh, ac also according to what you you said uh, uh, replying to the previous question, that you think that uh, populism in general, uh, not only right wing but also left wing. Uh, um, as uh, a category, a political category, is too uh, is a too more uh, is a too much umbrella term, uh, like a concept that can uh, I don't know how to say that, but uh, hold together a lot of different uh, political subjects, uh, movements, mm -hmm. etc., with totally different origins. Uh, mm -hmm. I think in Italy the League, but also. Podemos uh, in uh, in Spain, uh, etc., and with totally different po political programs because mm -hmm. we talk about right and left wing uh, parties, and uh, uh, I have this doubt because I think that there is like a risk of uh, of considering not consider considering the enormous differences uh, between them between these uh, populist actors. 
Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. So uh, when I talk about populism, uh, I, I really have in mind something that is, is more about organizational theory um, than, than politics per se. Uh, I mean, if you're talking of, about populism from like a political science perspective, it usually is this notion of, again, like a government that is somehow not responsive to the needs of the people. And then the debate is over how the people, whatever that is, is, is defined. And once you get to that stage, then, then the political dynamics are very different, which is why across the political perspective, I'm sorry, political spectrum, which is, which is why I'm careful not to draw equivalency, because I do think that there is a huge difference between something like uh, Podemos and what we were seeing maybe with like the, uh, the political radicalization of the Republican Party uh, and the so-called AstroTurf politics uh, of even the 1990s and early 2000s. So when I'm thinking of populism, I'm using a term that is incredibly vague and doesn't say too much. It just says that there's this notion of common people as a, and I'll just leave that aside because of course that's politically charged, the common people versus the elite. And that's just an antagonistic relationship that can um, be applied to any governance uh, as far as I can tell. So it's not very useful in a political, in a political sense. But what I have in mind behind that, which I, I didn't really bring out in the talk today, is a transition between the organizational structure of, of social movements of yesterday and today. So in some of my own writings, I draw a distinction between um, a more conventional SMO, a, which is just a social movement organization. And a social movement organization is usually very hierarchically organized. There's a, a management structure, essentially. So think of a labor, uh, a conventional labor union uh, is structured, you know, in a, in a very vertical way. Uh, and at the bottom of this structure is the worker and the worker essentially pays dues and maybe votes on something every once in a while, but their value is just as a raw number as part of a, a, a membership in those, one, in those sorts of organizations. The, the messaging from the social movement organization comes from a, a management class at the top. Um, in probably in the 1990s and on, we started seeing something called online social movement organizations. Uh, and those have a much more sort of horizontal organizational structure, meaning uh, in like the organizations that I've studied, um, the everyday users can actually contribute to a discussion forum and make, make themselves heard. Like their contributions can be, can be driving the framing. Of, of the social movement organization in a way that was impossible before. And part of that has to do with those economic notions of scarcity that I was referring to rather obliquely at the beginning. Even in a normal meeting room, like if we were all together in a physical space trying to have a meeting, like we are the, uh, the social movement organization, we're trying to figure out what our platform is and what our collective organizing agenda is going to be, what our framing is. We would have to like take turns, vote. We would have a physical restriction on the number of people that we could assemble given whatever building we were in, finite amount of time to get this done. But if you could imagine instead of that sort of physical forum being in a Facebook group or a news group or uh, a blog structure somewhere where all of a sudden the parameters of scarcity don't apply in the same way. It allows for a level of participation in those organizations that is somehow somehow different. So the, the social the online social movement organizations of today have a have a hierarchy that is uh, more there's more participation. It's a culture of a participatory culture, right? 
And that makes the control over the messaging more difficult to manage. And so when I'm thinking of, of populism uh, in just the gen general sense, just populism, I'm thinking of that kind of dynamic where there's a greater level of, of user participation um, that perhaps can drive the discourse. And it doesn't happen easily. Sometimes when the group becomes too big, even in an online scenario, uh, it's harder to, to make contributions where your contribution is actually acknowledged and valued because there's just too much going on. Uh, it also makes management of um, the content very difficult, like a logistical nightmare. Uh, and that can be for so online social movement organizations, or it can be for something like YouTube. The last statistic that I saw was that there are approximately 500 hours of content uploaded to YouTube every minute. So you can think about how difficult it is to scale up a platform like that and police all of, all of the content. So whether you're talking about a firm or a social movement organization, when I talk about populism, I'm more or less pointing to an organizational structure that is somehow somehow more horizontal. And I realize that these are just analytical approaches and in practice, there's a whole bunch of different things going on. And this is only one variable uh, among many. So again, I don't wanna to seem too deterministic in what I'm saying, but I do think that the technological affordances of uh, social networking sites and user-generated content sites have facilitated new forms of organizing. Now, when it comes to the difference between right and left on the spectrum, that's where I sort of awkwardly pull in these notions of authoritarian populism, uh, the ideas of conformity, of uh, loyalty to the party. And I think it's there's a consensus among sociologists who are researching this that the authoritarian streak, at least in the United States, which just happens to be the, the research that I have the greatest access access to the author the authoritarian streak runs deeper in the right wing than it does the left wing it's not to say that it's not present in left wing politics but when you're polling people who self identify as republicans they tend to uh, answer in ways that sort of betray a greater degree of authoritarian impulse uh, than on on the left and I don't know that it's always been that way. And I don't, I don't, I'm not sure why, what those factors are, but that's why I say, you know, if you're trying to look at different organizations, you have to go do the research and look and examine each organization individually. It would be very unwise to draw generalizations um, that somehow left-wing organizing and right-wing organizing organizing mirror each other. I, I don't, I don't think they do, but yeah, it's, it's a great point. And yeah, those are unwieldy sloppy terms. I, I agree with you. I just, I don't have a better language yet, but yeah. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I don't think in Zoom we have any other hands raised. I don't know if there are questions here in the room, yeah. Uh, good evening, Professor. First of all, I'd like to thank you for being with us tonight. Thank but you. I'd, I'd like to know whether, in your opinion, the, um, the decline in communist parties as opposition and of labor movements in general may have a role in the rise of populists, um, leaving them a free space in the political landscape in which to insert themselves. And if yes, uh, how important has been this factor in the rise of populism? Thank you. Yeah, that's also a great question. I um, I have my 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 opinions on this are developing over time. Uh, when I first read Marx, I read Marx in the context of uh, you know the the Italian school Marxists, uh, Tony Negri uh, in the United States, Michael Hart uh, in Canada, Nick Dyer Weatherford, uh, and of course Harry, Harry Cleaver. Uh, where the the sort of readings that I were that I was engaging in were reading Marx as uh, in the context of a of a sort of 
challenge to communist party structures. And of course, I'm also from the United States where I have no lived experience um, with communist parties. Uh, we, there, there was, and maybe still is an American communist party, but uh, of course my, the political reality I grew up in um, is, very, is very different. Um, but I have noticed within academic circles on the left that there has been uh, a romanticization, a glorification of a new technological environment in which we could see more radical forms of participation um, and sort of an abandonment of hierarchical organization. So I'm speaking to your question, which is I think a really important one in a very abstract, abstract way. And forgive me for doing that. It's again, just because uh, I don't have a lot of lived experience to draw on here. I started out very much in that area where I thought, oh, the internet will give us a, a new means of organizing and we will be able to bypass um, vertical, hierarchical, social structures, organizational structures. I was very much part of the cyber libertarian utopian discourse when I was doing my master's degree. The internet was going to be unregulatable. We will all become smarter, more self-reflective. There's no jurisdiction. You can't control information. Information wants to be free. All of this discourse I was very much caught up in. And I have become much more pessimistic um, as of late. And I think part of what concerns me is that politics, particularly on the left, has become more performative than powerful. So uh, I, I'm concerned uh, along the same lines as some Marxists um, like Jody Dean, who's a great, a great writer in the field of communications, uh, has a great book called The Communist Manif Manif not The Communist Manifesto, The Communist Horizon. Um, but part of the concern that she, I, uh, and then some labor organizer, labor organizer, labor organizers like Jane McAlevey, is that even within labor unions, what is now top priority is gaining visibility and protest, not organizing and going on strike. So when I was doing all of the research on Walmart and the um, workers who were trying to organize there, they couldn't strike because they've been so disempowered. Of course, labor unions in the United States um, were gutted starting actually under the Carter administration back in the 1970s. And then it was accelerated under the Reagan administration in the 1980s. So the organized labor um, scene in the United States is very depressing. It's abysmal here. Um, and it's upsetting. And so because of the attacks that's happened on organized labor, I think that the sort of organized collective action has gravitated more to performance, meaning we're going to go out and strike, but strike doesn't mean actually shutting down the operations it means we're gonna have a group of protesters out in front of the factory, out in front of the store, you know, holding signs and trying to draw attention um, to the plight of the workers. But it falls short somehow of, of uh, actually organizing uh, a shutdown of operations. Not to say that it doesn't happen, but that there has been an increased emphasis on this performativity. Um, trying to gain, initially trying to gain coverage from conventional news media, but then um, more recently, it's been about trying to gain uh, sort of visibility on social networking sites. So this is even true of uh, other collective organizations, uh, social organizations like uh, Occupy Wall Street was definitely about performance, showing up in a public sphere and getting news coverage. Uh, and, and that was great, right? The We are the 99% versus the 1% motto definitely gained traction and um, nicely summarized the class antagonisms in American society. More recently, Black Lives Matter uh, did a series of large-scale protests to draw attention to police brutality uh, and racialized policing. And so these 
these are certainly worthwhile endeavors. I'm not critiquing the, the protest movement, but I feel like there's been a lot of attention based on protest and performance more so than political organizing and uh, labor organizing. And, and I do have concerns about that. You all live in a context where uh, communist party infrastructure has a, a rich history, um, which is unfortunately oftentimes uh, just opaque to me. It's, it's hard, it's a, it's a long history. And I oftentimes the language barrier keeps me from, from learning more but where I come from, it's, it's, you know, I have to rely on Bernie Sanders and AOC uh, to carry the torch of, of anything remotely or uh, resembling a, a communist party or a socialist party structure. Um, and it's, it's in ascendancy right now. And it, to some degree has been driving the, the Biden administration. Um, but it, it's still weak, in my opinion. It's not up to the challenges that we face in terms of social justice or uh, perhaps even more significantly climate crisis. So it's a good question. And I just, I don't have a great, a great answer. I just have a lot of doubt <laughs> about the direction that we're heading in right now. Thank you. Uh, we maybe have time for one very quick question. If there is one. Okay, uh, I don't know. Otherwise, I would like to thank uh, another time Professor Caraway for being with us. Um, and uh, thank you to uh, everyone that, uh, part that took part in the conference, both physically and virtually. And thank you to the Collegio Ghislieri that uh, gave us uh, the spaces, both the physical one and the virtual one for this event. And uh, so again, uh, thank you for the very interesting presentation, Professor Caraway, um, for dedicating to us this precious time. I'm happy to do it. And I would just like to say it's a, a, a big thank you to all the organizers. Um, it, it is, uh, these, this is why I like being an academic. I like meeting new people and, and talking with uh, people and learning. The, the whole reason I'm a professor is so I can continue being a student. So um, these sorts of engagements are really important to me. And I would also like to say to anyone in attendance today, if any of these subjects are interesting to you, if you want to know more, if you need suggested readings, if you need help with your own um, studies, if it has anything to do with the platform economy and social movements, the economics of media, uh, you can easily look me up, just search for my name in the University of Toronto uh, and get my email address and send me a message. And uh, I will be happy to try and help you out um, as much as I can. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.